<laughs> hey guys, it's the captain here with another uh, Captain Meets and my special guest today. All the way from Stratford upon Avon, beautiful Stratford on Avon. It's the very Welsh sounding, but I gather not terribly Welsh, Lawrence Jones. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, <laughs> thank you ever so much for, for making the journey down. Um, and as is the way, I guess, with these kind of shows, we want to get to know you a bit better, talk about um, uh, your, uh, how you got to your career and uh, playing the guitar. Mm. Um, I know from reading your blog, you, you've uh, been recognised, you're a sort of award-winning uh, guitar player as you were sort of coming up through the ranks, regularly touring, recording. Uh, you're onto album number four now, I think, aren't you? Five. Five. Album number five. Five. Yeah. Um, so, you're still a young man, you know, even if I do say so oh, myself. <laughs> <laughs> so where did it, um, where did the guitar bug, when were you bitten? What happened? Well, my dad had an acoustic laying around the house and I've always been really competitive. So he'd pick it up and he'd play like House of the Rising Sun and he could play a few chords. And I wanted to be better than him. Fair enough. So I started um, the classical guitar mm -hmm. in, in primary school as it was at the age of seven because um, that's all that they had to offer there. Um, so I learned the classical guitar and actually did that for 10 years. Wow. I did all my grades, all my theory, all brutal. that. Brutal. Yeah, it was brutal. My dad made me, you know, um, practice four hours a day. Wow. And I just grew to, uh, to read sheet music, as it was, and I didn't want to do that anymore. Who were your sort of inspirations, if, if that's even the right word at that time? I mean, did you, were you... Were you listening to like you know John Williams and you know all the sort of the, the, the more traditional sort of classical and Spanish guitar players? No, that, or... that was the thing. I was actually so I'd I'd, I'd studied classical guitar, but I was listening to Jimi yeah. Hendrix right. and Eric Clapton, but I was just being focused on that because so that's all school. How do you, school how you get to through that though? You know, it, you know grades. I think for any kid, I, I've got my, probably offend the mm. established. <laughs> educator, you know, I. I, I, I I think the, the grading system, you know, the classical grading mm. system is probably the worst, um, what's the right, it's not, not worst is the wrong thing, but it puts so much pressure on a young mm. person to sort of, you know, succeed at a type of music that they're maybe not that into, and then there's some element, oh, you've failed. But I, I, do you think that's just your competitive and your determined character is just like, I'm just going to do it? Yeah, I just never took failure as an option. And, you know, even though they told me that my hand technique was wrong, um, my theory wasn't up to scratch as some people. I still got grade eight distinction, mm -hmm. um, and I pushed forward and put my heart and soul into the performance, which which um, yeah. over anything else. And without the classical guitar, I don't think I'd be the guitar player I am now because I use a lot with my fingers. Yeah, um, it gave me a lot of discipline. I spent hours being frustrated reading a piece of music that I didn't want to do. Right, you know. So it it really taught me a lot of discipline. So when I actually came to the electric guitar and I was like, wow, what's this that I can improvise with and do whatever yeah. I want? It opened up a whole different world for me. What, what, what so you said you started at seven and you did classical for ten years to get your all your grades. So was your your, your first introduction to electric was at seventeen, was it? No, it was it was at about twelve years old. Right. Yeah, my dad took me to the local pub, which is in uh, <laughs> is in Brails in um, Oxfordshire. Plus marks for parenting there. I'm loving it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And um, we went to see uh, a blues band just in a pub, and I saw that and I was like, oh, that's. That's awesome. That's where you want to be. And, um, and from then, I looked from where the blues came from, like Robert Johnson, mm -hmm. Big Bill Brunsey, and then Muddy Waters, and then, you know, I got into Buddy Guy, and then Steve Ray Vaughan, and then Jimmy, then Clapton, and it evolved from that, so I started oh, that's cool. from the bottom. What, yeah. what do you think, you'd, what were your dad's musical tastes? You know, what was always playing on the, the radio or the record player as you were growing up? He was up? into some weird psychedelic stuff, like the Groundhogs. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the Osric, um, Tony oh. McPhee. Do you know Tony McPhee? A great blues guitarist. Um, the name rings a bell. I thought you were going to say something like Osric Tentacles. And, and you Osric were. Tentacles, yeah, as well. <laughs> there we go. Super psychedelic yeah. then. And um, um, he loved Led Zeppelin. And, uh, great. Yeah, just loved the old school stuff. So the my old Floydy stuff in yeah, there. Floyd, like, uh, John McLaughlin. So it was a, a whole different wide range of just guitar music, even mm -hmm. our classical records and so everything I was hearing was just guitar. It right. didn't matter what genre it was, it was just good guitar music. And I guess, you know, while you were at school then, was that where your first kind of band 
stuff started to come together or yeah, was that I, later in life? Yeah, I was never really one for school about, you know, hanging around and learning other other things. I was just in the music block, any right. excuse I could get get yeah. in there. And I put my first band together when I was 14. Cool. And um, I was so determined. I I, um, I had, a, had a girl singer at the time mm -hmm. and I put the whole project together with, with a bit of help from my dad. Yeah. He would drive the tour van round and it was a work, He's a work van, so he's a carpenter. Awesome. So we put a sofa in the back of the van and uh, we'd flip a coin who went in the back of the van, you know, because we, we'd hate it because we'd be freezing. It, I'm not it'd surprised. Be no, and all the gear would and fall totally on top illegal of it. as well. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, um, I named my first band Free Beer because okay. I wanted to attract people into the pubs and they saw it on the poster. So we'd play these, these venues and I, I would book at the age of 15 about 100 gigs a year every weekend. Brilliant. And I'd call up and say, I'm Lawrence Jones's manager, you know, he's um, the up and coming guy, you know, will you come and book him? And he'd be like, yeah, and how old is he? You know, 15, well, I've got to bring your dad along. And my whole band were young as well. Yeah. So we'd go to all these places and people would be expecting free beer. So we'd buy about 20 pints, we'd hand them out round. Oh, fair enough. People so you were get, good, for you, good to your word as well. We're good. Then. People would get really <laughs> rowdy and into it and they'd have a a mega night and we'd always be asked back. And when was it that you first, I mean, you, you mentioned that your first band had a girl singer in it, but when, when was it, what was the moment when you realised that you were going to sing yourself? <laughs> well, her dad came to one of the gigs and saw how mental it was. The, the people jumping on the chairs and they had a lockout and people were smoking in the pub and, you know, his 16-year-old daughter was there and everyone was going crazy and she, unfortunately she couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. So I said, right, I need a singer, so I'm going to do it. Fair enough. Because I noticed when, you, when you're doing the, the, you know, when I was watching some of your YouTube videos, um, you know, I always think, you're, you know, you're, your voice is, you're, you're not like a lot of these guitar players who, um, phenomenal guitar player, and they get by with the singing. Mm. You know, your voice is a real, um, I think, if anything, it's, it's almost what I enjoyed the most about watching your, you know, your, you. You know it's, just, it's just a good singer. Um, but did that has that taken a lot of practice as well, or has you just naturally had a, a voice? I'd say the guitar came so natural, you know, like just it just came to me. Yeah. But but the singing I wasn't confident with, so over the years I've had to build myself up. I've mm -hmm. had tuition, um, vocal techniques. Um, I'm always singing when I can get the chance mm -hmm. to, and I always want to better myself. Um, and I got to the stage where I was like, right, if I want my guitar to shine through. My, vo my voice has got to be just as good because yeah. people are going to listen to that. If I'm going to attract them to listen to my guitar, I've got to get them with a song yeah. first. Yeah. So I just put in a lot of hard work and I don't want to copy anyone else. So I always want to have my own style. Mm. I'm not good at copying anyone else. I can't do a, a yeah. cover exactly right, okay. the same way. So... This band, so your first band was it? Did it just end up being a trio? Not the first band, but the first band that you fronted mm. was it just a trio, was it? Or? Yeah, it was a trio. So you're quite exposed then, aren't you? Yeah, it's very really just, exposed. There you go. And um, was that even original stuff, even at that age? Or yeah. Were you, so you were yeah. writing, yeah, singing, I think I started to, booking. Yeah, every, everything. <laughs> it was crazy. I was, I got my first record deal when I was 18. Cool. I recorded my first album when I was 17. We did it in. A village hall, and we slept there for three nights. And I awesome. got I got my friend to come down. He was he was pro, yeah. uh, Ollie Whitworth, and uh, he set up his own studio in this village hall. And we we cornered everything off. My dad was a carpenter, so we put fiberglass all in the windows and <laughs> kitted it out. And luckily, I got a record deal. And and I remember being really you know proud of that sure. because that put me on the map. And that know. that was then I I presume because I always often ask guitar players you know when you're going through school and college you know at what point is it that you go oh no I think mm. career for me is going to be in yeah. in the guitar but it doesn't sound like for you there was any it sounded like that you knew that from a super young age yeah right? I knew it would be guitar but I didn't know if it would be classical guitar or electric because mm -hmm. I put a lot of heart and soul into my classical and I remember going to um it was a guitar shop in Birmingham called Reverb mm -hmm. to buy a new Stratocaster, my first proper American Fender Strat. And I remember going there and there was some guys scouting for the college above. It was like called the Academy right. of Music and Sound, like yep. a rock school. And I'd um, got a place in the conservatoire in Birmingham mm -hmm. to do classical guitar. And I just played with a Strat and this guy from the music shop 
um, just played this guitar and I was like, oh, I've studied classical for all these years. I'm just going to take a chance. And I yeah. signed up yeah. to go to the rock school, as it was. Yeah. And I studied there for four years. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, then, and then went on from there, really. I mean, you mentioned that you find it difficult to sort of do a cover or a copy mm. uh, of, a, of a certain guitar player's style, but, but who would you have, who, who do you think, or who would you say as a, an electric guitar player you're, you know, you, you would listen to and be most influenced by? Jimi Hendrix, because, um, you know, the way he takes covers, mm -hmm. he doesn't do it exactly the same. Right. So even if I cover a Jimmy song, I will not do it right. the same. And is that, are you very consciously trying to break the song down and thinking which part can I do differently or is it just, no, you, you just I, play I it? just can't do it. It's just, do it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, the only thing I, I can do is, is be myself. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing I've always, you know, took pride in as well and, and learned that's my advantage yeah. of what I'm good at. Yeah. You know, I can, can't copy anyone else. So have you been then from, uh, you know, did you left school? Did you do? You did the the rock school yeah. thing, as you say. So that must have taken you through to what eighteen or nineteen years old or something. Yeah. And then, have, have you balanced your guitar playing career with a, like a normal job ever, or have you just that's it? Just... No, that that was it. I worked, so you've I never worked, known I'm... what it's like to have to be in an office at nine o'clock in the morning, no, or, well, or a well, building site at half past actually, seven in the morning. Actually, I worked worked with my dad in the oh, meantime you did? when when I had when I had my first band because I wasn't earning enough money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I worked with my dad, and he put me through a lot of hard labour. Chippy's assistant, exactly. Right, you know, doing all the all the horrible <laughs> crappy work. Thanks, Dad. It's, it's absolutely it's the right thing. I yeah. think you know. It's like at least you kind of know but, but, sometimes how lucky you are to be a, a, to make a living out of playing music. Yeah, but but I was I was determined not to have a normal job yeah. because um, I knew that it wouldn't fulfil me. Mm. You know, I, I worked in a pub as a glass collector for a year. And then I said in the pub, I was like, I'm not having this anymore. I will play for free outside in your garden bit if I can busk and put put a hat yeah. down. Yeah. And I had a loop pedal and I bust and I earned like 100 quid in two hours, yeah. more than what I would have earned in like 20 hours work yeah. there. Yeah. So, well, that's good. You know. So what would you say then when, you know, I'm just thinking for other people that are maybe listening to this that are perhaps... Um, you know, feeling like they've got some similarities to you, but but are still at, at school, mm. or maybe not at school, but you know, perhaps they're studying. We, we've got a fantastic local music college here called the Academy of Music, which obviously Great. I guess is a similar yeah. kind of post-school uh, diploma style mm. and degree style thing. So there'll be loads and loads of people there Great. thinking, I want to, you know, I don't want to have to go and get a nine-to-five job when yeah. I've finished here. What, what you know what. What advice could you give to say, look, a hundred percent, you know, do this or don't do this? Well, if it's if you want to do music, then um, look at all aspects to do with music. For example, I used to private teach, mm -hmm. and then I used to do my gigs at the weekend, mm -hmm. and then I'd um, get together and give people, you know, private lessons. And I actually ended up teaching in the primary school where I went um, and learned classical guitar, oh, okay. but teaching electric. Right. Because I came to them and said, you know, when I was at your school, um, I wanted electric and people have only given the choice to learn classical guitar. Yeah. So uh, you can do whatever you want as long yeah. as it's to do with music, you know. But, but do you, was there ever a time when you thought, you know, there's only so much sleeping on a sofa and eating beans every week that I can take? Maybe I know you've got friends, maybe who have got nine to five jobs, and then yeah. they're sort of going. Actually, they're going to get a mortgage now, and I can't. And, and I can't see that. You know, is there ever a point where you just thought, "Oh, I don't know anymore"? Or... You know, pe people people look at me and they go, "You know, you've never had a normal job. You're lucky." You know, but it's it's very. I went through some dark times and some very hard times, um, especially working with different record labels and being so young in the music industry. And going on tour with legends, you know, like my first ever tour was a was a UK tour with Johnny Winter, mm -hmm. and then I'd hear stories about how his manager used to put him on a drip to rip him off, and you know, um, it's a very it's a very cruel industry, and yeah. you've got to be tough into it. So I just put myself, you know, into it, and I said, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to look out for myself, treat my musicians right, yeah. and um, you can only be as good as what you can. So what has the um 
what has the last because uh, you're 27 now right 26 26 yeah. Wikipedia you let me down <laughs> <laughs> um, so 27 in a month so it's oh right. okay maybe it's uh, mm. anyway um, you're so you you know you're four album five albums in sorry uh, you've been sort of had some fairly decent tours mm. both as a supporting artist and as, as a headlining artist festivals all mm. kind of stuff What's been the sort of, you know, what's been the sort of the highlight and the lowlights so far of that last, say, five years or so? Wow, that's, that's a, that's a <laughs> question and a half. I think one of the highest points I've ever had was, um, was I got to jam with Buddy Guy mm -hmm. at um, Grollo International Blues Festival in Holland. Um, there was like 12,000 people there and he got, he got up to me, he got, I got up with him and you know, he said he'd heard about me and wanted to see what I could do. You know, so I'd grew up listening to the Buddy Guy and I get up on stage and he goes, oh, what key do you want to play in, boy? And I'm like, um, playing the key of C. And then I went, actually, you know, we're playing the key of A. He goes, you better be effing good, changing the keys around on me already. <laughs> <laughs> and there was all them people there, you know, putting the pressure on. But I like a bit of pressure. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I heard a story the other day that, that um, even relatively recently, the guitar player that seems to get the most out of uh, of someone else when he's on stage. Sorry, the guitar player that gets the most out of Eric Clapton when yeah. he comes on stage is Buddy Guy. Yeah. It's almost just like, I don't know, he's sort of... He's got an aura about is him. That what, yeah, is that what it is? He's a bit of a bad boy. Right. And I, and I like that. He doesn't, he doesn't care. He'll just go on. And what was funny is we uh, were meant to jam one song with him. I ended up jamming four, and he'd actually walked off stage and left me in front of 12,000 people to end the band. Brilliant. And he'd gone off in a, in a taxi back to the hotel. <laughs> and I was like, thank you very much, everyone. But you guys gone, you know, <laughs> left the building. It was just, it was just brilliant. It was um, amazing. And I've had some, some other amazing opportunities. I played with, um, with Eric Burden at the Royal Albert mm -hmm. Hall. Wow. And, um, and shared the stage with Van Morrison at the Royal awesome. Albert Hall. And we all got to jam together in Jules Holland on the keys. And uh, yeah, my dad was in the audience and oh. we, were sat, we were sat there and I turned to him and Eric Burden played House of the Rising Sun. I went, I'm, be <laughs> I'm better than you now. <laughs> you know, I finally did it. So that, that was a cool moment, but I've, I've had low moments where, you know, we've, um, I've played to like, you know, 20,000 people, 10,000 people. And then the next day we do a club gig and we have to play to 200 to 400 people. It's a big step, but um, I appreciate all the kinds, all yeah. kinds of different gigs because every gig is different. It must have been, I was going to say, even two to 400 is a good shout. Uh, I must admit, when I was in my teens, <laughs> we'd be lucky if my, my mum would come along sometimes. It'd yeah. be like, you know, two people propping the bar up I've, and that was it. I've, so. I've played l probably the lowest gig I've ever done. I've played to one man and his dog for three hours. <laughs> Just stood there with a pint, you know. But you got to do it because if if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have appreciated. Yeah. When I finally get there, and it's and it's all part of a journey and a learning yeah. curve. And I'm glad I didn't go into ten thousand people straight away because you know but nobody ever does. They it wouldn't, I mean, it have, wouldn't be you, right. No, I I totally agree. Or sometimes I think not so much on the guitar, but you know, if you're a pop, you know, pop artist mm. or whatever, you can get propelled yeah. to that kind of level of fame yeah. almost overnight, can't you? But I, I don't think. Well, su you know. supported. Um, there was a festival in Holland and supported um, Jeff Beck. There was Joe Bonamassa um, and Ringo Starr, and it was it was amazing. And my dressing room was opposite Ringo's, and he came out and all all the I'd happened to be in my dressing room and all the security had cut the dressing room off. Right. So I was craftily hanging around backstage. Didn't mean to be as I walked out. Ringo was there, you know, and I just said, "Oh, hi, Ringo. You know, have a great show, man." He's like, oh, great, man, you know, did you have a good gig? And I was like, yeah, he was like, oh, peace and love. And it was just little moments like that that was amazing. Then, you know, got to walk out with him and he's going on stage and Jeff Beck just goes, puts his high five out to ring and he just goes to me, I've just high fived a Beatle. <laughs> so even he was in, like, Starshot and my mind was just, it was crazy. I'm trying to remember what, there's, there's a great Jeff Beck kind of... Uh... Steve Vai anecdote, or it might be a Steve Vai anecdote about mm. Jeff Beck, but they've done, I think it was, um, they're doing the crossroads thing. Yeah. A apologies if I've got this story completely wrong, but it's a good story, so I'll tell you. <laughs> um, and Steve Vai 
has got to go and play at Crossroads and so he's out on stage and obviously surrounded by all blues yeah. legends and he's like I'm totally not a blues guy yeah. like that and there da, 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 da. and anyway so he does his bit and he comes off and uh, Jeff Beck's standing and he's like oh it's like you know I've just seen it's like crazy but amazing to meet you man or you know good luck yeah. and everything like that and apparently Jeff Beck just goes I ate all this blue shit. He just walks on, <laughs> does his thing. It's just like, fair enough, fair enough. He, but, he, uh, he was one of the, the coolest guys I've ever met. Yeah. Um, hanging around backstage because he was just sat there mingling with everyone. Yeah. And when people would come over and talk guitar, he's like, oh, I don't want to talk about that shit. He's like, if you want to talk about cars, cool. Yeah. But don't talk to me about guitars. And in a way, you know, I've got some amazing gear and I've been very fortunate yeah. to, to have some incredible equipment to help me, but I've never been one who's been overly geeky with things. Yeah. I like to have things that are simple and go along that's with a, it. That's an excellent link, yeah. Lawrence. Thank you very much yeah. for that, because I think, you know, we'll, we'll come back to sort of um, perhaps where, you know, what you're up to right now and perhaps what the future holds for you. But let's geek out. For, I know you're yeah. not a big geek, but, you, you know. I've got... A, you're geeky enough. Got all the gear, I mean, no like... idea. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what was the... You, so your first electric guitar was a Strat. Yeah. Um, have you ever... And, and I noticed you've got the sort of the, the customised sort of telly mm. thing behind you. But has have they been your, your sort of... You know, are you a Strat man at heart? Or have you have you done the whole thing in your in your sort of the 10 odd years? I've done you... the whole thing and come back to the Strat. Right. Because what's, I, the, I, what's the worst guitar you've ever owned then? Or not the worst, but the most inappropriate? The most inappropriate guitar I've ever owned was probably a PRS. Really? Yeah, that just ah. didn't suit me. I thought you were going to say some sort of like, you know, Floyd Rose loaded. No. Uh, no. Probably a PRS. It just felt, you know, just so modern yeah. the other way. Um, and to me, when I think of electric guitar, I think of it like an old battered thing, like a real 60s. This is a real 64. Yeah. yeah. And t to be honest, it sounds it's it sounds stupid, you know, and this is probably the geekiest thing I'll say, but you can feel the history in it. You can feel the wood's old. You can feel where it come from. And I grew up listening to the 60s music yeah. out the most. And, and, you know, Fender do amazing replica guitars. Yeah. But there's nothing like having the real thing. So... So Strat, would that be the Desert Island guitar, do you think, then? Just Definitely. That particular Strat, yeah. or just Strats generally? Or this a bit particular of both? Strat, I've had about nine, ten Strats mm -hmm. that I've always had and sold on, you know. But I'd never sell this one on. No, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Um, Amp-wise, obviously you've got a couple of amps behind you. One that doesn't surprise me at all, Fender DeVille. Mm. Can't, you're never going to get a bad sound plug in a Strat into a Fender DeVille. Um... The Countess is a, um, we probably know and love more as the kind of amp someone like Guthrie Govan might play. Yeah. So I wasn't necessarily expecting to see you with that. Yeah. Although I do like your LJ <laughs> thing on the front of the cab. What was it that, that attracted you to, to that? And you can't have had it very long, actually, because it's the Mark II, so it's no. been out for a few months, isn't yeah, it? So. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got that. I got that before it came out. I think I've had that about six months or something like that. Yeah. Because I wanted something that you could go on the road with and I wanted to back a, a company, an mm -hmm. English company, um, who would support me and I would support them because I'm a big believer of, um, you know, you help someone out and they'll help you out and together you can grow. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. And um, I'm actually endorsed by, by Fender as well, but I, cool. I do take this, this bad boy out on the road and it's just an amazing, clean platform for pedals. Yeah, I've tried loads of modern amps I've been endorsed by a fair <laughs> few guitar amps, I must say, but this is this is awesome. It, it it's got its own sound, um, but it's still classic. Oh, that's cool, man. And it's British, and yes, I well, for. I mean, I I know that. I said, we're, funnily enough, just, well, as you know, just before mm. you got here, Martin Kidd was in the store doing yeah. something else, and so it was nice to be able to introduce yeah, you to, really to Martin. Cool. Um, but he's a sweetheart guy, and we, so yeah, we love mm. all his stuff. Pedal wise, yeah. you know, nothing. There's nothing better than seeing a good board, <laughs> um, and you've got some things on here that I wasn't surprised about. Sweet Honey Overdrive, I can yeah. see, is very much your kind of vibe. You've got a reverb on there, Echoplex, Blues Breaker. Always nice to see those. The uh, Octavia. I Tyco know what type Brian. of effect of it is, but I've not heard of Tycho. It's the Tycho Brian. It's like it's what they they used the old components. 
um, from the original Octavius, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and they're quite they're quite rare. Um, they're made they're made in America, and I supported Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and I was like, man, what was that Octavia you were using? That right. sounded like the real deal. And he just hooked me up with them, and so thanks for that, Kenny. If you no, want that's to. cool. And yeah, it, it sounds it sounds really cool. Give us a stomp on a couple. Let's have a little listen because I'm kind of. Give so her a, this is give her a going tune up. into so this going into the into Fender. the Deville. Awesome. Your tuner looks like a transformer. Does it? Does it literally sort of? Oh, it's the that's the um, that's the wireless, uh, the wireless receiver as well, isn't it? Because it, any minute now, I'm expecting you to go <laughs> and turn into like you know. The no, one with the little. But I used to I used to do the lead, but I was always dancing around on stage, and you know, like I said, I'm, I am I am a geek when it comes to getting the right sound, but I like to do a lot for my show, and mm -hmm. I like to connect with my fans. Um, and this is the only way I can do it because I go into the audience. Right, um, crowd surfing. Yeah, so guitar solos. I, you, I, I act, have actually done that <laughs> with a lead, and it's, oh, it's, and so it's good, ended then. tangled around people's heads. Yeah. So. Did you realize you've strangled someone in the second row like that? Well, that's <laughs> massive headline. Actually, that's pretty bit fantastic publicity, wouldn't it? But anyway, whatever. <laughs> so this is just. Um, yeah, let's have a little listen to. That's just like that's classic, isn't that's it? That's just plugged in. Yeah, it's just classic. And then what I, I said, I'm not massively familiar with the Royal Blue, and you were saying you, you use that a lot. So. Yeah, it's it's just it's just such a lovely touch. Um, it's I'll, all my pedals are very subtle, mm -hmm. and, and um, I know it looks like I've got a lot of pedals, but I use them sparingly for different songs. Mm -hmm. But I like to keep you know one pedal on all the time. Okay. Yeah, as pushing it, and it's the Royal Blue Overdrive by my professor. Yeah. With a pedal on, off. Just, just, just fans it, it up a bit, yeah. Right. Do you ever use a pick? Yeah, I do. I was just looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you do. You want? I don't know what you use, I've but got, it, by um, all means, uh, one. borrow one. Have you got? Have you got a pick? Where is? Ah, oh, here we go. Here we go. Uh -huh. I normally, I normally, because I'm so used to playing the classical guitar, yeah. I normally just hold it there with, with my. So you've with my got that special finger. technique where you can go between picking and fingers without, because I can't hold the. Yeah. I can't hold the. Perhaps I can. I just need to practice more, but. Yeah. So so. And then what I use as my um, overdrive sound mm -hmm. is uh, my good friend Cameron McKenzie gave me this original blues breaker. Mm -hmm. um, it's mad that blues breaker loving thing because it, you know, I've been working in Anderton's for long enough to remember when that came out, and it was just a cheap distortion pedal. Yeah, you know, uh, and yet yeah. now it's like sort of People hallowed. Are crazy for having thing. They? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what, if they go for crazy money on YouTube, but like yeah, yeah the old bass uh, blues breakers um, are. Like everyone goes, oh yeah. People yeah. talk about that being like what the king of tone or something's supposed to be based on. It's like what? Well, I, ha I had the but, king of tone, right? And I prefer this. <laughs> it's I actually, mad, isn't actually it? sold, sold my king of tone for that. Um, I was wondering because the royal blue is the same color, I think, as the king of yeah, tone. Isn't it is, it? Is, yeah. that, is that kind of mad professor trying to do a no, king of tone? No, no, it's not. This because the king of tone's built on like a tube screamer, right? Whereas that's just like more like a clean boost, right? Right, right. Um, but but the blues breaker is is a really has such like a warm sound. Let's it's have, almost let's have like a, a valve. That, yeah, so this is normal without. <laughs> Sounds great. 
and all that's really left, because I know, I know we were talking before we started that the broadcast is on the board, but you've not really worked out uh, like how to fit it all no, in yet. No, 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 uh, yeah. So let's do the octave then, because that's wicked sound. Yeah, that's a cool sound. So I'll, I'll switch to, uh, to the victory. Yeah, yeah. So I've actually got um, reverb for this, because yeah. it doesn't have reverb on the amp, which... Uh... Okay, cool, so you wanted to hear the, uh, the Octavia, so... kind of sound the Octavia thing it isn't it? It reminds me of the, the dentist you know when they get when you're drilling a filling <laughs> in. Yeah it's yeah, quite it's, evil sound. It sounds yeah. fat. Yeah it, it sounds does. nice. I like it. This I like is a it really a nice pedal as well though the, um, the Sweet Honey Overdrive. I've used that quite a lot I like yeah. that. That's that's one of those you can plug it into any clean amplifier and get Sounds a nice distortion. Yeah, I mean, by all means, yeah, give it a, give give it a, a, a go. A... I am, and I actually prefer the smaller one to. Um, wow. Yeah, but Good I, for you. I messed up when designing this board. <laughs> I was going to say yeah, that. I did. It's I massively did. in the way, isn't there, it? And um, the guys who built this are Pure Vida Custom Pedal Boards, mm -hmm. made out in Madrid and Spain, and they're kindly replacing this pedal board for me because I was stupid enough to put the little wire next to the tune. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got uh, I got told by uh, Dan when we were doing mine just. Don't even bother putting the wire on the board. Yeah. Just have the wire separate. separate. Just leave it yeah. to the side of it. Yeah, um, that's what I'm gonna do. But yeah. this this sounds killer. This little wire. That's very cool. Well, look, we, um, I said before we started talking about the gear, it'd be fun to sort of know what are you up to kind of right now so if people mm. want to find out more about you. I guess they go to what, Lawrence Jones. Laur and Lawrence yeah. with an AU, with not a an AW. Yeah. He's someone else, isn't he? Lawrence Jones is, is someone else with a W. They've got a Lawrence Jones funeral director, so don't type that in. <laughs> that. Yeah, at least, not unless you need one. No, I, um, I have read him on Google now, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> is that another yeah. tick? Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so if they want to find out about you, but are you touring or recording right now? What's the... Well, um... For the last, I had a, my last album out was with a, a label called Top Stop Music, which is um, a label based off Sony mm -hmm. in Miami. Um, so, so I've been writing all year for my next album, and um, we've got show free shows out in Switzerland next week, mm -hmm. free headline shows, and then the week after I'm going to Curacao in the Caribbean to meet up. Tough life. Tough life. Yeah. To meet up with um, my producer, mm -hmm. um, the owner of the record label, Gregory Elias. Um, so we will be in a room 10 hours looking out at the sea thinking, oh God, we've come all the way to the Caribbean, we're not going to see any of that. <laughs> Collectively, like 20,000 people have no sympathy for you whatsoever. No, no. Just saying. No, Just but saying. It, it, does, it does get worse because after that we, we have to go to Miami to record the new album for two weeks. It's so. tough, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's just way, you should have stayed as a Chippy's assistant. I You'd know. Been so much happier. I know. Um, at least I'd have been at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then... You know, so what's left on the... I mean, you're, it's interesting. I, I, I've kind of... People will have heard me say this in previous sort of interviews and stuff, but the, the more people I interview, the more I, uh, the more I come to the opinion that actually uh, talent 
is earned, not born with, Definitely. you know. And it's interesting that, you know, when I meet successful uh, musicians and talented musicians, although they've all got sort of similar stories potentially about sort of a, a musical upbringing, mm. the, one, the one thing that just comes through is a determination to succeed. Yeah. That's, that's the common thread, is they're all yeah, very definitely. determined to, to get to where they wanted to go. But, you know, you've still got the bulk of your guitar playing journey ahead of you, so, you know, what, what's still on the bucket list? You well, know? you know, I'm, I'm not the best guitarist in the world, but I love and feel the music. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as I keep being passionate and feeling it and it, you know, and other people feel it, especially mm -hmm. my fans, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have some amazing fans, then just keep doing what I'm doing and going out there and keep progressing, you know, I never want to be on one level. I want to mm -hmm. slowly, slowly, slowly creep up and I don't want to shoot up there because the, the higher you shoot up, yeah. the quicker you come down. Yeah. So I'm looking to build a lifetime career around it, you know, it's what I do. It's it's uh, it is my life. It's it's built in part in music, yeah. and and yeah. music actually heals my heals my soul. You know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always had that. I've definitely I've definitely got the blues. I suffer with like Crohn's disease. Right. Okay. Um, and you know, there's been times where it's been really hard. You know, it's, it, sure. music's got me out of depression as well, and and things. So it's been it's it's been a real comfort blanket as well, and mm. and. Um, yeah, I think anyone who's out there learning a the guitar, you know, can, can inspire it. And it does have so many amazing rewards that um, people don't even know about. You know, it's not just about, oh, I want to make a nice sound. Mm. You know, there's so much more to it than that. You can make a great life for yourself with it as well. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a, I mean, that is a phenomenally positive message uh, about playing a musical mm. instrument. I mean, obviously, you know, you and I, guitar is, is what we play mainly but I, mm. I think most musicians would say you know it it's it's uh therapeutic on yeah, so many definitely. levels you know it's it's whether it's what you feel personally or how you connect with other people and do you know what there'll be so many people that'll knock you down and say oh that's not right or you know that's not the right technique you're not holding your pick right or you're not doing mm. that but who cares? Just make music, mm -hmm. make it for you, make it for the world, and mm -hmm. make it for the people, and that's all that well, matters. There's a song in there somewhere, isn't there? Definitely. It? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it, sounds like, it, sounds like, it sounds like a Michael Jackson tune somewhere in there. <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure yeah, having you on. Having I, I do wish you all the best with the new album, and you know, hope to see you all over the place in, in, the, in the future. And well, we'll be still touring doing what with... You Glenn Hughes from wow. Deep Purple in, in May around the UK. So if you guys want to come out, check it out. He's I'll, got some yeah, band, hasn't he? Down. Who's, who's going to be his guitar player? Because obviously... So oh, Soren. Soren. Soren's awesome. Such a lovely guy. And we yeah. supported Glenn um, in September around the UK yeah. and they was awesome to us. Has he still got nice guys. Uh, Jason Bonham playing drums or was that just the thing he did with... Was that just that was Black, Black Country, Country Communion. Communion, yeah. So it's different, like, so it's Soren, Glenn and... Yeah. But Chad Smith plays on all his all his live albums, so that's not bad, then, is it? Glenn's really Glenn's <laughs> really good good powers of that. I always think Glenn Hughes, whenever you see him on you know, you see him on stage like that, and he's such a phenomenal like rocket of a character. It's it's impo it's like you have to pinch yourself to think how old he actually is. Apologies, Glenn, obviously, if that's supposed I to think, be some I, sort of I trade think secret. Glenn's, yeah, but Glenn's he's just amazing. Glenn came up to me, I think he said it was like 69, 70. And he, uh, he can rock out every every night, and I went to him. You know, what's the secret? Because obviously, you know, no, no, no. He he, you know, he's he he admitted to us that you know, I mean, in the music industry, there's there's drugs and alcohol yeah. everywhere you go. It's it's at your fingertips. Yeah. Um, and and it's and Glenn was affected by that, like a lot of musicians, especially back in in mm. that, in them days, because it yeah. must have been, you know crazy <laughs> and and some of the stories I've heard from people that I've supported you know oh. but but with but with Glenn you know he's um his secret is now is he's found a healing with um Buddhism and, right and with his music and um I said to him you know how, how do you do it every night he says good sleep you know good food I think he's vegan right um and he tapes the curtains together in the hotel so no dark comes through so he's 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 old school he knows the road oh know. it's fair I mean again what a, I mean that'll be a great tour won't it and yeah a, you know what a fantastic show that'll be if you get to see it so cool. um well I I asked you right at, you know mm. before we even started this if you would mind uh playing out with just a like a 
uh, where you sing and play some kind of laid backy kind of okay. blues stuff, or whatever. So um, that's going to be cool. And yeah. um, we'll, you'll hear that next now. But for the time being, uh, thank you so much thank for coming. Thank you very on. much. Appreciate uh, it. Good luck with everything. Cheers. And uh, anyway, Lawrence Jones, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> cool, man. All right. That was fun. A ship out on the sea. I'm drifting and drifting, just like a ship out on the sea. Well, if I ain't got my baby, oh, I ain't got a single thing. If I could take you. If I could only take you back If I could take you If I could only take you back You know I'd have love and happiness Oh, the blues wouldn't destroy me